coming to the uh, Uportal State of the Project for 2019. I'm Jim Helwig. I am at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and I am currently chair of the Uportal Steering Committee. Hi, and I'm Benito Gonzalez. I'm with Unicon and a lead software developer for Uportal. And uh, so, really simple agenda. I'm going to do a little bit of a year in the review, some of the stats and numbers from the project. And uh, Benito is going to do a technical update, get into some of the features that we uh, have implemented in the portal this year. Um, and then uh, what's next, meaning uh, really what's next uh, for you. So looking back, uh, year in review, and these May 1st of 2018 through May 31st of this year. So actually 13 months um, uh, instead of just 12. That way we get to pick up uh, some of the goodies that just happened um, over the last couple weeks. So again, thinking about uh, uPortal, what is uPortal? uPortal is not just um, this uh, software project um, one repository that's been around for uh, almost two decades. It's really a collection of things that make up the uPortal ecosystem. So we do still have the core uPortal project. Um, I'm thinking of that as a core platform. We've got a lot of uh, portlets that, um, uh, th those, that code is still out there. Those are individual uh, repositories. We also have supporting services. Those are maybe some back-end um, systems or tools that um, are used when you're implementing uPortal. We also have a number of front ends, so those are, that's all the code that we have. But uPortal, the part of the ecosystem is also the community, all the developers, implementers, um, and all the activity that we do together. So over this last year, we've had uh, 170 releases across 13 different projects. There's um, many projects in uh, the uPortal uh, ecosystem, many repositories, but 13 of them had um, uh, uh, releases done. Interestingly, I think it's the uPortal uh, web components project, if I recall correctly, that has over 70 releases just um, in and of itself. Um, here's just a list of those 13 projects that had uh, releases over the last year and the latest versions of those that are available. We had five projects entering the uPortal ecosystem, <laughs> but uh, we had five new projects entering the uh, intake process. Uh, so that was something that I think we really kicked off last year. Um, but it was great to see it really some continued uh, momentum growing in that and that folks are realizing that you can actually take um, that project, some code that you're working on, get it into the uh, intake process um, and, and hopefully um, get it adopted within the project itself. Um, this shows you uh, um, which ones are new as well. We've got 20, over 27 active contributors. Um, this is not just uh, committers, but these are um, others that have contributed code. Uh, we've, but we had 27 um, people that have contributed, more than 27. We uh, recognize that there are other ways to contribute beyond just uh, submitting pull requests. But we have uh, over 27 people that have uh, submitted pull requests um, to uh, our various uh, projects in the uPortal ecosystem um, uh, over the last year. Ten of them are new, so that's kind of an interesting thing, and I really, um, I know Julian and Christian in uh, uh, France during the uPortal Summit, they really encouraged some of these folks to submit their first um, pull request, so that's, that was kind of exciting. Here's a list of uh, everybody that I could identify that has submitted code to uh, the uPortal ecosystem over the last year. Uh, we remain uh, with three uh, uPortal supporting subscribers. That's Oakland University, uh, Brigham Young University, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
and you'll hear more about um, this at the very uh, next to last slide in this deck, encouraging you to be a, um, become a, a, your university to become a uPortal supporting subscriber. And again, the idea there is if we can get enough funds to sustain an actual um, uh, uh, hiring somebody to assist with the uPortal project. Um, currently, we've got you know, $26,000 uh, a year coming in. That's not quite what I would call sustainable enough to, um, uh, to hire somebody. But if we have a few more people, a um, few more universities join, uh, maybe we can maybe, or, um, or commercial affiliates join, um, oh, yeah. we could uh, make some progress there. Now, or last year we had four um, uh, virtual webinars or uh, hangouts. Um, we had the one on the web components in the fall, and then we've had at least three um, Uticon open source uh, support updates as well. And we had three in-person meetings. If you count the um, uh, uPortal meetup at last year's conference, and then the two meetups that were at, um, uh, held at the same time um, in Arizona and in France in February um, at the winter summits. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. Thinking those up and being able to have the overlap phone call, excellent. And last year we had uh, 10 presentations um, or uh, workshops at the conference. We had over uh, 780 discussion list posts. The list remain active. And just a few other things I wanted to highlight um, from uh, this last year that aren't kind of code or feature related um, before um, uh, Benito gets into those. Uh, we migrated uh, from some old legacy Atlassian um, hosted products to uh, the Atlassian cloud. Uh, we consulted with Sage Sharp, a um, diversity and inclusion and, um, consultant. Uh, that was a great conversation, uh, looking at how we could be more welcoming um, in the uPortal community. I think we're you know, pretty welcoming, um, but we could always use more uh, diversity and participation. And we just wanted to see if there was something that perhaps um, we hadn't thought of and, um, that may be a barrier to participation. And as we mentioned before, had a couple great um, winter summits. And uh, the last thing I'll note is that we're starting to use, um, we've been using GitHub uh, IO for the documentation for the um, uh, uPortal project, uh, and, well, for a number of the projects. But now we're going to, um, we're starting the initial steps of using it for our project website as well. We'll get to those priorities later. And now, over to Bedino for development updates. There we go. Hey, all right. I'm going to talk about uh, uPortal releases. I'm essentially going to spend the next several minutes reading to you from the release notes. So there won't be anything too exciting. I'm just exposing this. If you miss anything in these slides, Go to um, GitHub to the uPortal repo and just look at the release notes and you'll see the exact same thing we're about to cover. Uh, in uPortal 5.1, so 5.1.0, I believe, was released just before the conference last year, but 5.1.1 and 2 were towards the end of the month. Um, some of the things that came out in that time frame for that series of releases was the new uh, CSS Flexbox layout that allows the number of columns are dynamically changed depending on the width of your browser. It doesn't seem exciting, but it was for us because before that, everything was very much static. <clears throat> uh, shared identity and role information in the REST APIs. This was the beginning of being able to uh, secure APIs and that next step for supporting web components in a richer fashion. Of course, our, our documentation in, in French really took off and, and blossomed at this point last year with uh, some real effort and commitment uh, from our friends over in, in France. Switching over to uh, uPortal 5.2, which was a couple months later, the big thing there was that we, we dropped JIRA uh, for the most part 
for the portlets and in uPortal and switched over to using the GitHub issue tracker. Um, do we still have a Jira installation for uPortal? Yep, uh, but it's, uh, it may be read-only right. um, at this point, but it's there for legacy purposes. Perfect, yeah. So if you need to open issues, I encourage you, even if you're not a developer and you just run into a couple of problems with uPortal and it's a technical issue, go ahead and uh, set up an, an issue in GitHub. Um, screenshots would be great. Uh, certainly give us some detail. Uh, the only thing we don't like is uh, it doesn't work without any reference specifically to what that is that doesn't work. Uh, adding filtering to the portlet registry is one of the things, again, one of these small incremental changes that really opens uh, what we can do in the front end. So the carousels, both uh, content carousel and um, the dashboard carousel leverage this to get in along with the grid some of the grid components allows us to filter down to exactly what we want to display based on category. So you know, leveraging that metadata that's already being captured in uPortal. Small thing, but big, big impact. And then several library updates. I don't know why I threw that in there. There's going to be a ton of library updates. Oh, Flexbox. Two, four, wait, did I skip three? Well, anyway, you see the effect. So essentially, dynamic columns. Yay. All right, switching over to uh, uPortal 5.3. By the way, we got all the way up to 5.6. 5.6 was released last week, so very timely here. Um, <clears throat> at 5.3, we started uh, putting in some of the front-end technology we need for ES6. If you're not familiar with JavaScript, uh, it's gone through iterations. It evolves. That space actually evolves quickly. ES6 is kind of this point, inflection point where you can write some really good JavaScript code. You have things like classes and other modules. Just uh, language level features that make it much more pleasant to write JavaScript. But to be backwards compatible, you need to do something else for all the browsers who don't support the features you want to leverage. And that's where this CoreJS and Regenerator runtime come in to allow you to go ahead and leverage those things. I remember tweaking on a, a web uh, component long time ago, and I kind of gave up because of the IE11 compatibility issues. And I was working with Sinclair on that one. It's like, oh, this is too much work. Um, so we kind of moved on. Uh, with this kind of functionality now in uPortal, uh, if we revisited that, it won't be a problem. Uh, we have removed some uh, concepts over the last several months, and one of them here in 5.3 was a template user. Some files are removed, and there is a need for this new system layout XML to kind of compensate for that piece. So if you're doing an upgrade and you were, there are a few who were in uPortal 5.2 or earlier, and if you're going to upgrade to the latest version, in uPortal start, you're going to see some changes in your data file, so be aware of that. You're going to have to adapt to those changes. There's also a health check that was added. In particular, this helps institutions that have a load balancer, and they've configured that load balancer to check each of their servers and make sure, hey, is the server still responding? Instead of just hitting the home page and getting the guest view or something else, now we just have a little API that's like, hello, I'm still alive, um, to make it easier uh, and less impactful for those load balancers to test the servers. Moving over to uPortal 5.4, at this point we're talking about early of 2019. Um, we'll see uh, support for uh, sessionless access to APIs. This is the point where we really do leverage OIDC, uh, that's OpenID Connect, so that we have um, support for securing those APIs in a, a, a standardized fashion. Um, again. Combined with web components, we're, at this point, we're really starting to make progress. And you'll see in the next section uh, what the results are. Uh, hopping down, skipping that one bullet point, and talking about specifically the theme name equals ignore case tester. Blah, 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 mouthful. So that particular PAG, if you're using that, you might see some issues in your log with guest layouts. It occasionally acts up. Um, we're kind of taking that out. Uh, you want to avoid using that particular tester, and we found that there's no real need for it. It's really based on theme, and since Responder is really just a default theme on the back end of uPortal that everyone uses, it almost has no consequence. Um, 
So it's something, just remove it if you still have it in your uh, uPortal. Uh, five, so we're getting close. This brings us almost all the way up to the middle of May. At search indexed for Portal, starting to interact with um, some other things like Lucian uh, for searching. Uh, add a direct URL. Let's see, there's Seth over there. Um, so that he, they had an interesting problem. That was they have embedded content in their page, where it, where it seems easy to just grab the URL, a direct link into a particular portlet. When you're kind of dealing with embedded content, you need to get further out or further in. Um, it's easier if you have this ability to just surface that URL out of the context menu, and that's now available uh, for everyone in uPortal. Let's see, the uh, hamburger menu, uh, usually something reserved for mobile use, and now it's available and, and quite useful and looks attractive in a full browser window. Uh, again, Tacoma has a, a great example of that in their current portal that they're about to launch, right? Well, it's not current. You guys are very close to launching. Excellent. <clears throat> and then providing secure server-to-server -server access. This is something that was developed to integrate with uh, uh, Fizan notification backbone. Did I get that right? Um, and so this allows uh, that those two services to communicate directly, uh, as opposed to some kind of URL the feed. So that's new. I did look into this a little bit, and I'm concerned that we need to develop some more documentation. But where don't we need to develop more documentation? And the last thing is 5.6, which was just cut last week. There was some cleanup. There was these uh, modules. They just aren't being used. So we're, we're doing that little bit of effort of removing code and um, Gradle content that just doesn't provide any usefulness to anyone we know of. If you actually need these or use anything that's getting removed from your portal, please just speak up. Uh, we certainly can bring things back. But as we start cutting a code back, um, we, we, we are trying to listen to, to see if anyone's using it, but we may not catch everyone uh, with all their customizations. Right? Uh, let's see. Um, so that was all the things that happened to uPortal. A lot of the portlets, the changes have just been minor upgrades, a few features here and there, nothing really earth shaking, except for one note, and that is notifications in and of itself has had uh, the tooling um, switch to Gradle. So no longer is it a Maven application, it's now Gradle. Um, and kind of along with that same port project, a lot of the front end has been replaced with web components, and we'll touch upon that here in just a second. Uh, the thing is, we really are about web components at this point. Um, we've seen a ton, just an amazing amount of development in this space with some beautiful, beautiful um, content being rendered. Uh, I keep looking at Julian because he has an amazing um, web component that I'll be showing in a slide here in a second. But there, we have a lot of people doing these things and contributing. And not just web components, but we've got our Angular front end with uPortal Home from Wisconsin. That's something that really kicked off this kind of explosion. They did a lot of things with regards to APIs and getting the content out of uPortal to do a separate app that sits in front of uPortal. Um, while some people didn't uh, go ahead and jump on uPortal Home, they've come up with uh, their own front ends inspired by that and leveraging the changes that, that came about from getting that front end started. But really, we're, we, we've seen a lot of web component development. Uh, those repositories are very, very active. So what's a web component? And just a bunch of APIs uh, for reusable encapsulated HTML and really form the basis of web apps. In particular, on the next slide, we, web components are really a, just a simple way of, of saying content that's based on usually these top three, four, sorry, four items. We're getting the flashing monitor again. Uh, templates, which I've used without doing web component development. It's essentially a hidden div. 
uh, great technology, simple to use, custom elements, uh, that's really kind of the crux of a web component, at least most people think so, and that, that we leverage Shadow DOM to make it effective so we don't have CSS and other code bleeding in or things bleeding out of the web component, and that's what makes it very independent and robust. Uh, and then ES modules is another way to kind of isolate things and bring them in and out. And uh, <coughs> Let's go ahead and skip this. This is why we use web components, but it's essentially what I just described. It's a way to encapsulate functionality uh, on the page. So where do you go and find these web components? What's currently available? Uh, we have a, a couple of repos. There are currently four, with the fifth being developed uh, this week. It should be hitting the uPortal contrib group soon, and I hope it'll graduate within a few months if we uh, focus on graduating. Mm -hmm. uh, um, some of our products. Uh, there's uPortal web components where initially we just started throwing a bunch of components in there and that is the first place to look. There is some fantastic stuff in there and I'll list a couple of things to highlight what's, uh, what you can find. Notification web components within just the last few months we went from hey we should change the bell and notifications to a web component to uh, four I think four um, web components the notifications has really been resurfaced. Y if you use the modern version of notifications, there's no portlet front end. It's really about feeding in uh, uh, web, web components. Uh, there's the card web component, which is mainly one item to help with uh, language. And then form builder. It's a, a, a content piece that uses JSON schema in the back, so you can define text and fields it will then present a form for users to submit data through and they capture it. Uh, so that's a web component, a pretty hefty one. And then lastly, this nav menu component, which kind of goes along the lines of Enbro's mega menu um, and kind of driven by Sinclair and their current portal effort where we use, uh, instead of tabs, the menus that are, um, have some depth to them and shows sort of a, almost a preview of what the content is. <clears throat> so you portal web components, it's you, you, the, the key web components there are the content carousel, which you've seen in a lot of the demos lately or screenshots of uh, the portals that have a modern look. There's a dashboard carousel, which instead of just displaying an image, actually brings in portlets, so dynamic content is popping up. Uh, ESCO Content Grid and Family, a beautiful rendition of a huge web component, composed of web components that give you a real UI that's, that, that's usable. Uh, and then the waffle menu, uh, inspired by kind of that Google waffle item up in the corner of their pages. And finally, just leveraging like something like eyebrow user info. And notifications, again, replacing all the front end content for that. Portlet with web components. Uh, yeah, I'll speed through it. Uh, form, form builder. <laughs> okay, we'll t just talk about those real quick. It's just the icon, a modal, so that certain notifications can be filtered, or you set that up with a filter and say, give me any notifications that might be of a certain priority or fit a certain category, and I'm going to pop that up for the user as a modal so they have to acknowledge it before they move on. Banner is a, uh, another way you can filter notifications and if one is present it will pop up almost like an alert but in the page and not be a modal that will distract the user from continue working and then finally your notifications list which is just replacing the standard view of, of notification. And then kind of the last two to, to kind of focus on our form builder. Uh, that's ready to go, that's available today, and that allows you to um, prompt your users for form submissions, and you get to build that all out through just developing XML, uh, or sorry, JSON, JSON schema, uh, no coding involved. It's just set that up, um, configure it, and then reap all the data out of your database from user submissions. And again, that last piece is the nav. We don't have an official name for that repo yet. That's still being uh, developed. Um, it's in some developer's personal space, and he hasn't even decided on the exact name he wants for the repo. As soon as we get it, we'll let you guys know. Um, so 
all these portals we've been looking at um, on the Unicon side, talking to clients, looking at prototypes, the two that have garnered the most praise are uh, this one, Pomona. And I think the big piece here is that middle, se middle section where we're using the dashboard carousel. That's going out and getting real information and servicing it to the user in a nice, compact way. You can cycle through sideways instead of eating up a whole page. So it makes things nice and concise and really delivers what we've always envisioned for a portal, a personalized view of the institution. Julian, this is this is what he's done. This is sorry, I, this is not even a good screenshot of this, but it's this gorgeous web component where the second half is the um, content grid, right? And uh, I've leveraged this in some designs that are about to get launched. Um, it's apparent that there's some stars in there, and that's how you favorite content. You do that, and then it that dynamically appears in the top area. There's support for images, uh, information about the user. So there's several web components involved in, in this major web component UI that we've broken out and used already. So that's the best part. It, we're not recoding anything. Just like with portlets, we're taking existing code, leveraging it, configuring it. Maybe we have to add an enhancement here or there, add a, you know, a new attribute. But yeah, this is, this is where we want to be, and this is the first time that we can really say, you know, maybe we don't need portlets anymore and focus on the new technology. All right, and um, so a few calls to action. Um, you know, we had great participation on the user lists, so I encourage folks to um, continue to use those, and if you have a question, um, we've gotten pretty good at, at Mattis. We get questions uh, from time to time. And the first thing we do, if, if we get an individual email, we say, hey, why don't we uh, um, ask on the list so that everybody can benefit? So the more we use the lists, um, everybody's uh, benefiting. And if you look at it, there's a lot of people on these lists. Now, most of them are quiet, but um, you know the audience is there. Another thing to uh, do is consider putting on a webinar. Uh, we did one uh, last year on web components, but there's nothing to stop us from, um, oh, I was thinking like um, uh, earlier, Mary said, hey, if we wanted to, if anybody wanted to, to get into the technical details a bit more about um, their user-centered portal um, project, um, or on the methods that they were using for user research uh, that they could give her a call. Well, that actually, that's the type of thing that we could have as a webinar. Um, a webinar is just, it, it doesn't have to be some formal presentation. It can just be, let's get together on a Google Hangout or, or something and uh, share and talk. Of course, I'm always uh, encouraging people to contribute code and uh, documentation, and we really did see a pickup of new people um, contributing this last year. So please go ahead and do that. Also, the um, intake process. If you've got a project that you're working on, go ahead and um, propose that to the uPortal intake process, and um, we can uh, more rapidly get these um, pieces, these repositories, into the product itself. Another thing is uh, consider joining the uPortal Steering Committee. We'll be spinning up um, a new round of elections uh, soon. There's a few people, um, uh, a few uh, positions that are going to be opening up on that. And the, you know, it's mainly the minimal um, uh, requirement is that you participate in our once a month call. But really, we're looking at, it, it, this is a list of uh, priorities that um, the steering uh, committee identified or came up with themselves um, um, earlier this year. And so we're trying, you know, th these things are not code related priorities. So these are, you know, things that we can do beyond um, writing uh, code. And uh, the U Portal Steering Committee can help shepherd progress in those. And uh, we'd love you to uh, help out with that. And finally, as promised, an invitation to join the U Portal Supporting Subscription Program. Um, 
you know, multiple uh, levels at which you can join. And uh, I think if we do get enough people participating in this, um, we could really uh, do something. We have, uh, I believe, um, uh, $76,000 in the bank right now. Um, again, it's that, that's not enough for us to go out and actually um, hire somebody at this point because um, we burned through it really fast. Um, but uh, we're getting there. And so with more people joining, um, we could actually execute that. So let's continue the collaboration and move the project forward. Thanks. Any uh, 